Hi, I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to How to Encourage Post-Traumatic Growth in Your Clients. Gentle ways to help your client look back positively at the past. Every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit so spoke Napoleon Hill. And we all hear so much about the bad effects of suffering, but as therapists and human beings, we do well to remember the opportunities for growth that personal adversity can offer people. We should never deny or downplay the impact of suffering, of course, but part of the impact may be personal growth, and we shouldn't deny that either. We can help clients to experience post-traumatic growth and feel better about their lives by establishing a sense of benefit, however hard that might be to see at first from their current or past trials. And this reminds me of the ancient story of the king's beggar. And once upon a time, a downtrodden beggar, nothing to the world and soon to be forgotten dust, through sheer unstinting effort, sprinkled with a good measure of luck, rose in life to become a trusted advisor to a king. And such were his qualities of honesty and wisdom that he soon secured a place smack bang in the heart of the king's affections. But as everyone knows, favourites attract resentment and a jealous tide began to swell. The advisers whom the new man had displaced began a poisonous campaign, a whisper plot, to sabotage his position. They spied on the king's beggar as they disparagingly dubbed him, to see if they could find a way to catch him out. And their luck was in. Every night in his wonderfully furnished apartment in the palace, they watched the former beggar go into a certain antechamber where he would remove some bricks from the wall and then stare at something he was obviously hoarding there. Very suspicious. Soon, like viperous smoke, their evil insinuations sinuously crept their way into the king's ear. They more than hinted that there was evidence that the king's favourite was stealing the royal wealth, hoarding it away and gazing at it with glee each night. And the king at first would hear none of this. But then the sparks of doubt fanned, as they were by the jealous courtiers, took hold and were pretty soon burning wildly in the royal heart. How could this favourite, whom he had trusted so much, have so deceived him? And at last, one night, the king could bear it no more. He strode into the luxurious apartment he had himself given the beggar and confronted the man who had once been a penniless beggar. And the king roared, I have it on trusted authority that you have been stealing from my royal treasure chests and each night gaze upon your ill-gotten gains. And I command you to open up the secret compartment in your wall and show me what you've been stealing from me. Very well, said the erstwhile beggar calmly, but what you see may surprise your majesty. Just do it, roared the king. So the one-time beggar prized certain loose bricks out of the wall and revealed a pair of the most tattered and dirty old shoes the king had ever seen. Relieved to find no stolen treasure, his majesty was still perplexed. So why do you come here each night to stare at a pair of worn-out old shoes? The former beggar looked at the king with level eyes and said, because it's not despite having come from beggarly beginnings that I'm able to fulfill my duties for your majesty, but because I was once a beggar. Begging taught me the true value of patience, faith, trust and hard work and the inner value of people over outer appearances. The time in my life from which these poor broken sandals come taught me to see people clearly, to see both their generosities and meannesses, to have resilience but also strategy. I look at these sandals every day to remind myself where I came from, where I could so easily go back to. These beggar sandals are the most important thing that have ever happened to me, more than wealth and position, because they taught me how to be and that, whatever happens, I can survive. And at these words, the king shed tears at how easily 
he had been led to doubt his royal beggar. So people can learn, of course, from tough times. And we seldom now talk about character and how character is built or strengthened through experience. You know, we love personality and forget about character. We're more likely to talk of how adverse experiences weaken people rather than can sometimes in some ways strengthen them. Experiences like commercial commodities are seen as undesirable or desirable rather than as toughening or as opportunity for the development of wisdom and character. And this is a great shame in some ways, you know, partly because it can make people feel ashamed of having bad experiences. And we deserve our clients if we steal any sense of the good bad experiences can possibly bring them in some ways. Human emotional distress has been so pathologized and medicalized that it's come to be seen as something that should be eradicated altogether. If that, as if that was possible. But if we really can only gain certain kinds of wisdom from adversity, then the impossible aspiration for us to be happy all the time might actually have, have a weakening effect on the human race. Clients can come to feel ashamed of previous episodes of depression, or even of having had disadvantaged childhoods, as if any admission of not being perfect and normal is blameworthy. The, the meaning people place upon their experiences determines how empowered or disempowered they feel with regard to those personal uh, experiences. And the worst scenario is when someone feels their damaged goods unequal, inferior, because of what's happened to them in the past. It's important to think in an anti-fragile way sometimes. So if we think about the power of anti-fragile, the writer Nassim Talib coined the term anti-fragile, meaning someone who is not just resilient to a stressor, but actually benefits from it. So for example, if we look at Wolf's Law, which describes how bones are not just re made resilient to the stress of weight-bearing exercise, but strengthened by it, um, then that um, carries over to the psychological realm. Street kids in Mumbai learn to live by their wits, learn to think strategically, have to maintain hope against all odds, and these are strengths from adversity. And of course, too much adversity can weaken us with overwhelm, but even the weakening effect may only be temporary, as the person comes through it and resumes gaining in strength. Now, it's vital to help our clients lift depression and overcome addiction and PTSD and so on. But at the same time, we can help clients focus not just on what they've lost through disadvantaged pasts, but what they may also have gained in some way. We're not trying to convince people that the trauma or hardships they endured were actually a good thing, you know, but rather that they carry some kind of learning nutrition that can be helpful and strengthening in some ways and may not become active until long after the events themselves. And this can help people feel more confident and less like damaged goods. So here are three therapy strategies to help your clients benefit from post-traumatic growth. Number one, what did they learn? You sometimes hear people saying things like, if only that hadn't happened, or why do bad things happen to good people? And that kind of thing. Perhaps we're here to learn. I sometimes talk to my traumatized clients about post-traumatic growth. I do this only after we've stopped flashbacks and nightmares, of course, because otherwise it would be it would seem like trying to put a positive spin on what still feels really awful and terrible and negative, which would be ridiculous. Okay. So but once things have stopped and they're not suffering so much, ask your client what they've learned about life and themselves from those past experiences. If you've deconditioned a trauma with a rewind technique, you might ask your client to consider both what they learned from the trauma itself and what they can now learn from overcoming it. For example, if someone has felt intense fear and flashbacks for 20 years, but no longer does uh, after your treatment, then they've learned that what felt stuck and immovable wasn't stuck and immovable, and that everything can improve even when it feels like it never can. And this is a massive learning. If you've uh, had PTSD removed, then you'll be grateful for the rest of your life for a normal day. If someone was depressed for a long time, the lesson from that might be that they now know clearly what their emotional needs really are and can respect themselves enough to meet those needs better in future. Why did that have to happen to me can transform into what did I learn from that time or those experiences that has or could make me stronger. 
As with most things, timing is vital. Asking someone who's just come in your door wanting to tell you their woes, what they've learnt from their adversities might break rapport at the very moment when what they need is to be listened to. But along with other interventions, the what have you learned question can help the meaningless produce meaning. Number two, talk about powerful crux points. Failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. So those are the uh, words of J.K. Rowling on the benefits of failure. It is during a crisis that we really learn what's important to us, what really matters. And as with uh, tip number one, we can talk to our clients about how adversities of all kinds can lead to opportunities for growth as the desperate something has to change crux point is reached. Okay, things get so bad that something has to change. All fear is about expectation of loss. When you feel you have already lost everything and there is now nothing to lose, then strangely that can feel liberating and strangely fear can subside and real gains can be made. A friend of mine once uh, described how years ago she had had a terrible fear of flying, but she heard her mother was deathly ill and needed to take a flight to be with her mother. She made that flight through a tremendous storm, but amazingly felt no fear. Nothing mattered to me anymore except that I got to see my mother, she said. So things were stripped for her in a sense and bare essentials became apparent. One client drew a blank when I asked him what his latest depressive crux point had enabled him to do, until he suddenly said, well, I became so desperate for help that I came to see you. Uh, and I guess that was a backhanded compliment. And it's true, but it illustrates that the fact that necessity is the mother of invention, and so is desperation. And from desperation, growth can happen. Number three, use metaphor to encourage post-traumatic growth. I've suggested these before, but I make no excuse for repeating myself here because they work so well. I might talk to a client in or out of hypnotic trance about how it is the stone that is thrashed around in the sea that ends up the most beautifully polished. Or to um, someone who suffered adversity as a child or any time in the past, I might talk about the oak tree that becomes tall and strong, weathering the storms and ends up the most interesting in appearance and eventually big enough and strong enough to provide shelter for animals and birds. Not at all like those spoiled, overprotected trees that just grow up boringly straight, protected by plastic cones. Okay. So again, I would emphasize that the aim is not to convince our clients that what happened to them was good, but simply to introduce the possibility that they, they can learn from them. We, we just want to help them where appropriate, feel they can benefit in some way from what happened to them. And to use the roughage of life, as Dr. Mil Milton Erickson called problems, to provide some kind of nutrition for them in the form of better judgment, more wisdom or resilience in the present and future. When people are depressed, anxious or jealous or angry, they use their own imaginations against themselves and other people's best interests. By using therapeutic metaphors, we help people use their imaginations constructively. And we might also tell someone the story of the king's beggar when it comes to helping people grow, not in spite of, but because of their past, however bad it was. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And as always, thanks for watching. Music